Okay, family, we are now in session. We had a little technical difficulties, and I wanted to thank everybody for joining us for the financial plan and essentials webinar. Um, as I have mentioned, planning. put your phone on, put your, could you mute yourselves, please? Thank you. Um, when did we start this program, Jerry? Um, probably about two months three, ago, three or four months ago, three or four months ago. And the reason we, we, we're having the webinar, because when we first introduced the program to you, it was during the general membership meeting, and you couldn't get a full grasp of what the program was about. So what we're doing today strictly is going to be a presentation from our financial advisor, counselor. Um, I, call, I call him Jerry. How do you say your last name? McGarren. McGarren. Jerry McGarren. It's going to be about an hour, but I highly recommend that you stay focused and stay tuned because... We always talk about we absolutely need more money. I am the first one to tell you that. But my grandmother always said it's not it's not about how much money you have, which it really is. But it's not about how much money you have; it's what you do with the money, right? And one of the one of the one of our colleagues said to me, "So you want me to take my little five dollars that I make and you want me to invest it?" And I said yes because not to offend anybody, but in the Bible, Jesus fed five thousand people with one loaf of bread and one fish. So I so I therefore have the faith that with the proper guidance and education that we can take the monies that we make and we can make it grow and so that we can live comfortably. So I'm going to turn it over to Jerry. He can tell you more about the program. And then I hope and I hope that you all take advantage of it. It's one of your benefits in addition to your prescription and your eyeglass prescription. From your eyeglass benefits, it's an addition to your current benefits and no additional cost to you. So like I said, take advantage of it, prepare for your retirement, for your kids' education, and just plan on learning how to invest money and, and, and respect the dollar. Okay, Jerry, it's on you. Thanks, Davini. Um, as, as Davini mentioned, this is a free benefit to you. It's paid for uh, uh, by uh, your union, and uh, it provides six hours a year of free financial advice. And we could talk about any financial matter you want. It could be retirement, investing, you know, your deferred comp plan your pension, uh, buying a home, getting out of debt, you name it, any financial matter uh, we can discuss. It's absolutely free. Uh, again, it's paid for by uh, your union and um, we don't sell anything. So strictly just advice. So we run these webinars. Um, this particular one is called Financial Planning Essentials. And, and what it's designed to do is just go over uh, topics that everyone should be aware of. And, um, and and it's designed to get you thinking about your own personal situation. And and hopefully with that information that you get today, you, you want to expand on it and set up an appointment with us and we'll go over everything in more detail um, on an individual basis. Before we get started, I, I do have a, a poll question I want to ask. And then I have uh, uh, two poll questions at the end of the webinar. So I'm going to start that right now. And... This is the first question, if you don't mind answering. This is what, which age group are you currently in? Okay, great, thank you. And if you have questions during the webinar, feel free to type them in in the chat room, and um, I'll do my best. If I can't get to it during the webinar, I'll, I'll certainly answer them at the uh, at the end when we have a Q and A. So these are the things we're going to go over today: um, cash management, education planning, insurance, investing, uh, retirement, estate planning, and then finally where to go for financial assistance. When we first start our consultation, we need we need a starting point. And everyone should know this. It, everyone should know their net worth. And a net worth is basically a snapshot of your finances. Everything you own is considered an asset. That could be your home, your deferred comp plan, money in the bank. That's an asset. They all have value. Everything you owe is considered a liability, which is a debt. You know, it could be your mortgage, car payments, student loans, credit card debt, so forth. Assets. Less your liabilities equals your net worth. And our goal is to build your net worth to as much as possible before, for example, before you retire or before you reach some goal that you want to reach. And we do that by increasing your assets and by decreasing your debts. 
and therefore building your net worth. Now, a lot of folks, you know, live paycheck to paycheck. And, um, you know, you get paid every two weeks, let's say, and it's gone in two weeks, get paid again, it's gone. And, and, and a lot of folks really, really don't know where it's going. Now, money can really only be applied in three ways. You pay taxes on it, you save it, or you spend it. Okay, uh, we can pretty much identify what your taxes are going to be and what you're saving. It's the spending that's the key issue, and um, and 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 that requires if you really want to get a handle on what your expenses are, developing a budget. Now, a lot of people don't like that word because it, it restricts you on what you could spend. But what I recommend is you determine what your net net take home pay is each month, and find out where it's going. Go back to bank statements, go back online. Everything now is online. So you could pretty much figure out where your, your money's going and put them in categories. You know, how much do you spend on, on uh, you know, rent or mortgage? How much do you spend on eating out? How much do you spend on commuting? How much do you spend on Starbucks in the morning? And, and try to identify where all your money is going, okay? Then you look at each category and say to yourself, well, you know, I'm kind of spending too much money here popular one is eating out, eating out or ordering out. And um, that's a popular one. So you, if, if you want to cut back on that, take the savings from that and then use that savings to put it somewhere that's more beneficial. For example, adding more to your deferred comp plan or uh, paying down some debts. Okay. But it all starts with the budget. You need to know where your money is going. And it can be eye-opening at times. It's amazing when you really put it down on paper. You're like, wow, I really spend that much money on, on coffee in the morning or, or, you know, lunch or eating out, DoorDash, you name it. Uh, you'd be surprised on how much money you spent. Now, I, we always recommend that everyone have an emergency fund. An emergency fund is amount of cash just set aside um, where you don't spend it, it just sits there in the event of an emergency. You know, let's say someone loses their job or let's say there's someone becomes ill. You don't have to want to resort to credit, like credit cards, and especially now with interest rates booming right now, you don't want to have to resort to credit cards and build up debt in a time of need. You want to have some money set aside for these emergencies. Uh, like I said, it could be anything from, you know, losing a job, becoming ill, maybe something going wrong with the house. It's always good to have money set aside. Now it's recommended three to six months of, of living expenses, which is your really your take home pay. I, I, that's hard to do, um, but anything is good. Anything, you know, you wanna get out of the habit of, of living paycheck to paycheck and developing a budget could free up some money that you could put more towards your, your emergency money. And your emergency money should be kept safe, should be just in a savings account or a CD and you shouldn't invest it. Uh, in the markets. I mean, markets are down 20% this year. You don't want your emergency money to be lost because you may need it tomorrow. So you want to keep that money safe at all times. Now I'm going to talk briefly about credit. Your credit is extremely important. Um, your credit basically dictates how much of a risk you are and what kind of loan terms you'll get if you're ever applying for a loan. Your credit score ranges anywhere from 350 to 850. Obviously, the higher the credit score, the better. There's three main factors in determining your credit score. The first and most important one is your timeliness of your payments. That means you should try whatever, however possible, not to be 30 days late on a payment. Once you're 30 days late, it shows up as a negative on your credit report and stays there for seven years. Okay. So uh, very important, even if you have to make the minimum payment, try not to be 30 days late. The second factor that um, determines your credit score is your unused debt capacity. You know, let's say, for example, I own four credit cards and the total credit that, uh, that I'm allowed to have, let's say is 5,000 each or $20,000. Well, let's say that I, I used up 18 of it. So I owe 18,000. That's a bad mark because it's showing that I used up all of my credit. I don't have any wiggle room left. I'm kind of uh, tapped out, so to speak. And that that's a negative on your credit report. If I only had $2,000 outstanding of $20,000 uh, available, uh, that's a good 
a good a good sign. So my my score improves. The 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 percentage of debt to credit should always once it reaches thirty three percent. That's when it have starts having a negative effect on your report. So a, a lot of folks will ask, you know, let's say I have those four cards I mentioned and I don't use one, should I cancel it? A lot of times the answer is no, because if you cancel it, it brings down that unused debt capacity because your the amount of credit you have is is lessened. So that percentage gets uh, of of debt gets larger. Okay, so um, credit companies like to see you have a lot of credit available that you don't use. And then finally, the third factor is your credit history. How long have you had debt and credit and, and what's the history with that? Other information that can be found on your credit report is, you know, personal data, your history, inquiries, uh, public records. Everyone should order their credit report once a year, at least. It's, you can get it at annualcreditreport.com. It's a free service and you need to, you know, look over it. Um, you know, you want to try to improve your score, but more importantly, you want to make sure that the data on this re on this report is accurate. In the in the day and age of identity theft, it's very important to stay on top of your accounts. Okay. Now, I use I'm not recommending this. I mean, I am in a way, but I'm not endorsing it. Um, I use a an app called Credit Karma, and it identify it alerts me every time. Let's say something is opened in my name. So if I open a new credit card. It's going to alert me and say, "Did you open this card?" Um, and it'll say, "It'll show it'll show me how much debt I have compared to my credit limits. It'll show me my you know how timely I am with my payments." So it's a pretty good uh, way to keep track of your data and it helps again protect against identity theft. Now, when I mentioned before that um, you know, in order to maintain a high credit score, you want to make sure your payments are made on time. Uh, and if you have to, you make a minimum payment, but I wouldn't recommend that as a long-term plan. Okay. And the reason being, it's going to become far costly to you to make just minimum payments. Let's say I go out and buy the latest and greatest flat screen TV for $5,000. Okay. And I only make minimum payments on that. Well, it's going to take 21 years to pay off. And in the end, I would have paid $7,351 of interest or a total of 12,351 for a TV that I probably don't even have anymore because now it's outdated. So uh, it's important that if you're, if cash is um, not available to, to make the minimum payment, but uh, it's also important to start not make the minimum payments for the life of the, of the loan. Now, one strategy to, that I found very effective is that let's say I have- The lawyer. Let's say, no, I have, that's not the lawyer. Oh. let's say I have four credit cards and um, I'm trying to pay down the debt. And instead, let's say I have, you know, $400 a month to pay off the credit card. So instead of making $100 payments to each of the four credit cards, make minimum payments on three. Let's say I make $50 payments on three of them because that's the minimum payment. That's called the snowball. Uh, and, then snowball. I'm yeah, and then I'm left with 250 and I apply that to the lowest um amount of the lowest card and i get that paid off then i take that 250 and apply it to the next card and get that paid off and then the, then uh, three, 300 to the next card and until they're all paid off so you're kind of like winning the battle instead of just throwing 400 dollars into the into the sea of debt you know you're kind of, and still hey, say, how are you? yeah i'm four if, if everyone away. could please mute. Could you mute your phones you could just uh Sorry, Jeff. Yeah. Yep. So finally, your your checklist for your managing your cash. Set goals for your money. Get a know your net worth statement. Find out exactly where you are right now, and and set a plan to build that net worth. Follow a budget and live within your means. Maintain your emergency uh, money or your fund. Monitor your credit. Very important. Get that score higher, uh, and keep bad debt to a minimum. Bad debt is debt that you bind something that doesn't appreciate in value. Good debt is a mortgage education because they are you're buying something that appreciates in value or, or you can earn more income if you have it bad debt is like credit card debt it's it's you're buying something that that depreciates in value and it normally has very high interest rates so um 
next topic, we're going to talk about college. And, and college is, the cost of college is ridiculous. I mean, uh, costs vary uh, depending on where the you know, student goes, whether it's private or public, in state or out of state, um, and what type of degree. Now, if if you're you know lucky enough to have be smart enough to get into Ivy League, it's going to cost you about eighty grand a year. Okay, um, I'm going to see if there's a way to mute everybody. Yeah, if I could just remind everyone to have their phones muted. Um, Harvard's eighty thousand a year. Uh, a, a private uh, college like Pace, let's say, uh, sixty nine thousand a year. Out of state for a public school, let's say someone wants to go to Penn State, fifty five thousand a year. A state school um, like SUNY is twenty five thousand a year, and then uh, City University School is about seven thousand dollars a year. So um, the SUNY and City schools are a great deal for your money. Uh, you know, a lot, of, especially de depending on what you're going to study. I mean, you have it's a tough um, conversation to have with a child on cost of college and what they want to study and where they want to go and so forth but you want to make sure that they don't uh, graduate with a with a boatload of debt that they can't get out of so how do you fund college well you do it through your own savings um, you may get financial aid there's there's two types of financial aid there's federal aid uh, federal and state aid and then there's school aid um, federal aid there's a form you have to fill out every year called a FAFSA form and it's pretty, you know, pretty black and white. It basically says, here's what you're, that you could provide. And here's what you can get as far as aid or loans. Uh, school aid, they're a little more flexible. If, if the student, um, if they want the student to be there, you know, either based on, on you know, merit or, or athletics, you know, uh, the school aid may be greater. You may get more money directly from the school than you will with financial aid. Uh, there's also scholarships, uh, uh, but if you have to resort to loans, there are uh, student loans and parent loans. Student loans are what are called Stafford loans. They're in the name of the student. It's the student's responsibility to pay it off. The parents don't have any responsibility whatso whatsoever. Um, but you can also get um, other types of student loans that where the parent co-signs, where you're both responsible. You can also get parent loans where the, it's only the parent's responsibility uh, to pay it off. So there's... There's always a way to pay for college or any education. It's just a matter of how much you want to borrow and, and what kind of interest rates uh, that apply at the time. Alternative methods for funding um, school could be taking out you know, a second mortgage on your home or refinancing or, or borrowing against your pension or your deferred comp plan. You know, things I don't often recommend, but it is available out there. So what we would do if if you're in a situation where you have to pay for education, we sit down and go over all these alternatives and, and figure out what, what's the best way to do it without paying a lot of interest or without getting the, the student into too much debt uh, upon graduation. One great way to save for college or any education, I should say, is uh, what's called a 529 plan. And I recommend this to do for your own children or even your own grandchildren. I do it for both my, um, I still have a, a teenage daughter and I also have uh, six grandchildren. So I set up a 529 plan for each. And each state has its own plan. Uh, if you can use any state's plan and the child can go or the student could go any anywhere in the country. Uh, I live in New Jersey and I set my, uh, my child and my grandchildren up with New York's plan because New York's plan is an excellent plan. And so I highly recommend you do that. And if you live in New York and you choose New York's plan, you get a state tax deduction uh, when you file your state income tax return. Now, this money, uh, the benefits of this money is that if you if it's used for education, it grows tax free. And when you take it out, the, it, the withdrawals are tax free and it could be used for any kind of education, anywhere from kindergarten up to secondary education, like college, trade schools, things like that. Uh, so it's a great way to, to save for college or, or education. The only downside is that if you pull it out, let's say, you know, I have money in my daughter's 529 plan, but I want to go out and get a new car uh, and I take it out and buy a new car. Since it is my money, it's in my name. I get taxed on the growth of the money 
and I have to pay a 10% penalty. So let's say I put in 10,000 into this plan that grew to 15. I'm going to have to pay tax on 5,000 and I pay the uh, a $500 penalty for taking it out and not using it for education. One way around that is this plan is portable, which means that, you know, let's say I have my daughter doesn't go to college. I could change the beneficiary to one of my grandkids. And as long as they use it for education, then the withdrawals are tax-free. So you can change the beneficiary or the student, uh, you know, freely. So if one doesn't use it, another person can. Next topic um, we'll talk about is insurance. Now, the first, we're going to talk about life, disability, and long-term care. Now, I have to say this, that, and I've seen this many, many times, um, if someone is depending on you for income, whether it be a spouse, partner, child, it's an absolute must that you have insurance, life insurance. You have to ask yourself, if I pass away, is there anyone going to be worse off financially if I'm no longer earning my salary? If the answer is yes, you absolutely need insurance. Okay, 50% of the U.S. population is underinsured or has the wrong type of insurance. Now, there's two types of insurance. There's term insurance and permanent insurance. Term insurance just covers you for a specific period of time. So let's say I buy a 20-year term policy. Let's say I buy it for $200,000. If I die, my beneficiary gets, if I die within that 20 years, the beneficiary gets $200,000. If I die in the 21st year, they don't get anything. It just covers you for a specific period of time. Whole life or universal life covers you for forever, as long as you pay the premiums. It also has a savings vehicle built into it, so it builds up cash value where term does not. However, term is, uh, permanent life is about four times more expensive than term. Now, a lot of folks may not need insurance in retirement. So it's, it's, you know, it's important to have insurance up until the day you retire. That's the most important thing. So term insurance is appropriate in most cases. It's less expensive. And I'd rather see you take the extra money and put it in your deferred comp plan than, than buying whole life. Uh, uh, because we really just want to cover why you're working. You can buy policies through a group plan. Let's say it's offered through, uh, you know, the city or, or, or you know, uh, you may belong to a group where uh, it may be cheaper in the beginning. They're, they underwrite it based on age groups. Or you could buy it on an individual basis where the, the premiums are calculated based on your personal circumstances, your health only. So how much insurance do you need? Um, you know, you have to figure out, you know, what future earnings are going to be lost. Do I want to make sure that the mortgage is paid off? Do I want to make sure that the children have enough education funding? So all those things factor in on how much to get. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that you do have a death benefit from your pension. So if you die, the, the pension pays out a death benefit. And th this is only if you die while in active service, but the death benefit is only three times your salary. And that's in lieu of your pension. So your beneficiary is not going to get a pension. They're just going to get three times your salary as a death benefit. So in, in many cases, um, that's not enough because you're giving up a pension that's going to last the beneficiary's lifetime and instead just get three times your salary. So it's very important to look at how much insurance you have, if you have the right type of insurance, and, and just get that in place and make sure you're covered uh, you know, through retirement or until or until no one else is depending on you. Disabilities insurance is the insurance uh, to protect you in the event you become disabled. It, it's designed to replace your income if you become disabled. There's short-term disability for minor injuries, usually lasting up to about six months. And then there's long-term disabilities that it's designed to replace 50 or 60% of your income. And um, if you have something that lasts from six months on, and, um, you know, it can be de very devastating. A disability can be uh, even more devastating than a death because you're not only not bringing in income, but you may have at least the same, if not more expenses because of the disability. Okay. Approximately 30% of all Americans between age 35 and 65 will have a dis disability that lasts 90 days. So it's just something to consider. Um, 
now that you know all the baby boomers retired, a lot of them right now are going into are starting to need long term care. Now, long term care is is what's called custodial care. Your your health insurance and Medicare when when, when you retire will cover medical expenses, doctors' visits, hospitalizations, prescriptions, and so forth, but they do not cover custodial care. Custodial care is helping someone take medicine, helping someone transport themselves, helping someone get dressed or bathe or so forth. You know, um, activities that usually take place like in a nursing home or assisted living or having a home health, health aid come to your house. This type of care can be very, very expensive. It could cost up to $600 a day. And, um, you know, so you're looking at, you know, $18,000 a, a month. I mean, it, it's very high. Now, um, since your health insurance and Medicare doesn't cover the cost, you have to pay for this on your own. So what happens is you, you pay out of your own pocket. Then once your money is spent down to a certain level, depending on if you're single or married, um, then Medicaid will kick in. Medicaid is a state agency. And then Medicaid will then pay the cost. Uh, if you want to protect your assets from spending it down, or if you don't want to qualify for Medicaid, then you have to find ways to fund it yourself. And one way is to get long-term care insurance or a product that provides a long-term care benefit. Long-term care insurance is very, it's expensive. It's complicated and a lot of companies don't even want to write it anymore. So it's 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 kind of a, a, a terrible part of the insurance industry right now. But um, they're coming out with new innovative products that that make it a little bit more affordable, like buying life insurance with a long term care benefit attached to it. Something to think about. I always recommend that, it, you know, if you're at least 50, 55, that you start thinking about it and look into it at least. So your insurance checklist is determine how much money you need, how much how much will you need for protection? Determine the type of policy you need. Is it term? Is it whole life? If you have a whole life policy now, is it worth keeping? Should we do term instead, and and you know use the cash savings for something else? That's a possibility. Uh, you know, if you get coverage in your workplace, it's not portable, which means once once you once you retire, the the coverage is gone. You know, shop around. It's very competitive out there. So if you have Looking for term insurance, um, there's plenty of great websites uh, to shop around to see to get the best the best quotes. So next, um, we're going to talk about investments. Now, if you've been watching your deferred comp or your investments this year, I recommend that the best strategy is don't look at your statements. Um, market's down about twenty percent this year, and um, uh, it's the biggest decline since we had since the 2008 housing crisis. So it's not pretty, uh, but we may want to, um, I'll talk about it in a minute. We want to talk about the long-term history of stock market. And, and for most folks, uh, really st stay the course. And I'll explain why. But there's three types of investments. Um, basically, there's cash, bonds, and stocks. Cash is for short-term needs, like your emergency fund we talked about earlier. Um, it's money that you want liquid, money that you want safe. Cash, though, because it provides such safety, earns anywhere from zero to three percent a year. Um, now, cash does not keep pace with inflation. Inflation right now is at eight point six two percent. So, um, you know, you don't want too much money in cash because you're actually losing purchasing power of cash. I find it weird to say you don't want too much money in cash, but um, it's just not. Uh, it's going to lose purchasing power if it's not invested. Uh, bonds are like CDs. You buy them from a company or a corporation. They promise to pay you interest. Uh, they can average around 4 to 6% a year annual return. And then stocks are, you're actually buying shares of companies. You're actually an owner of a company, whether it be like Apple, Microsoft, so forth. There's a lot of volatility. Like I said, stocks are down 20% this year, but if you hold stocks for the long term, you can average around 10% a year growth. So stocks are in the long term, the best place to keep money. Um, if you have time on your hands and if you're okay with volatility, it's the best place to outpace inflation. And here's an example. This chart shows 
the stock bond and cash performance over the last 100 years. These blue lines here represent stock market over the last 100 years. As you can see, there's a lot of volatility. You know, we had here in the lower left corner here, that's the Great Depression. In the middle here, there's the late 60s, early 70s, where we had extremely high inflation, Watergate, Vietnam, you know, uh, oil crisis. And then we had what was called a bull run, where the, the market just kept going up until we had the internet bubble bursting in 2000. Then we had the housing market crash in 2008. And then in 2020, we had a pandemic crash. Uh, it's not shown on here. Actually, it is. There it is. The pandemic crash that would stock market lost 30% in just six weeks, but it recovered. As you could see, in each case where the market drops, it does recover over time. And this year, we're going through one of those down periods where the stock market is down about 20%. The orange line here represents performance of bonds. Bonds are more conservative. As you can see, there's not a lot of volatility, but not a lot of growth. They're, they're more designed for safety and income. And then the green hot line here is like a flat line. It represents cash investments. And cash doesn't grow, but you don't lose value, but you do lose purchasing power. You know, if, if, if you have money in the bank, and again, you always want money in the bank for emergencies and short-term needs, but if you have extra money in the bank that's earning 1% and inflation's 8%, you're losing 7% a year on that money because it's buying 7% less in goods and services because of inflation. Now, here's an example that what we're in right now with the market down 20%, we're in what's called a bear market. A bear market is defined as a, a period of time where stocks are 20% off their highs. And in the last um, 40 years or so, 45 years, we've had about one, two, three, four, five, six, 10 bear markets represented by these orange, this orange graph. And as you could see, the bear markets last, it varies. It could last a couple of months. It could last, um, I think the longest it was the, the housing market crash last two and a half years. You know, right now we're, we're most more likely in our ninth month of a bear market. Uh, actually, no, actually more closer to the 11th month, 11 months of a bear market. Um, we don't know how long it's going to last, but what it does show, these blue parts of the graph shows that it does recover over time. So for the most part, everyone should, you know, for your long-term money, like your deferred comp, if you're losing money, yes, you are losing money. Everyone's losing money this year, but history shows that it will recover at some point. I'm going to skip over this slide and I'm just going to stay on um, the fact that the volatility of the market. Now, let's say that you have money in deferred comp, you just received your September 30th statement and your account's down a lot. And you're like, I, I can't do this. I can't lose any more money. I'm already down, you know, let's say $10,000 this year. Um, I want to move my money to stable Five. value and I want it to be safe. And that sounds good for the time being, but you're trying to time the market and timing the market is, is almost impossible. Um, if, you know, you have to be right when to get out, let's say you move the money out of stocks into stable value. Well, when are you going to get back in again? You're probably going to get back in when the market's already recovered because that's when you get your comfort level back. And here's an example. Let's say that I had $10,000 to invest in 1980. Now, this is obviously a fictional story because in 1980, I didn't even think I had $10, but Let's add $10,000 to invest in 1980, which is 40 years ago. And I put it all in the stock market, the S&P 500 index, and I didn't touch it. And I opened my statement 40 years later, I would have $708,000. That's a pretty great return. But let's say I wanted to dabble a little. And mute your phones, please. Let's say I, I dabble in the stock market a little or I get spooked. Let's say um, I got scared in 9-11 or the housing market crash or the pandemic. And let's just say out of the thousands of days of trading over the last 40 years, I missed only five days, the five best days 
my account would have only grown to 458,000. I would have lost almost half my investment because I tried to outsmart the market, which is impossible to do. If I missed the 10 best days, I would have only grown to 341,000. Missing the 30, only 135, and even missed the 50 best days, it would only grow into 62,000. And the best days of the market usually follow the worst days, and that's when people get out. Okay, so it's very important. You know, the markets are based on fear and greed. When fear's at its highest, like they, it is right now, stocks drop because people sell. People get out of their stocks, move to stable value, it causes the market to decline. Okay, when greed's at its highest, People are buying, There's, you know, they want to make money. Everything's going great. You're buying stocks. You're, you're put, moving money from stable value into stocks causes the market to go up. So human nature though, human nature tells us we sell when we're at, when fear's at its highest and we buy when greed's at its highest. So we're, we're selling at the wrong time and buying at the wrong time. So again, really what it just comes down to, if you have money, especially in deferred comp and you have a long time to invest this money. You may be not going to retire for 10 more years, 20 years. Stay the course. This money will, history shows, will come back. And you can't outsmart the market. Um, so your investing checklist, establish goals for your money. Uh, start early. If you're not in putting money away in deferred comp, you know, do so now. Even if you put in 1% of your salary, doesn't matter. Get started. That's the... The biggest obstacle is opening the account and getting started. You know, I hear all the time, I'm going to wait until this. I'm going to wait till this happens. And then I'm going to put money in. Don't even wait. Just do 1%, whatever you can afford, and then increase it as money gets freed up or as you get raises and so forth. Uh, make sure your investments are consistent with your goals. Understand what you're in. You know, what, what type of investments are you in? Diversify, meaning don't put all your eggs in one basket. And, and, just monitor your investments. I don't, don't look at it every day. It's going to drive you nuts. And um, especially in the markets like this, you know, periodically meet with us, see, see if you're in the right investments. And most of the time, we're just going to be like, stay the course. If you're in good investments, which you have good investments in your plan, uh, deferred comp plan, usually you just stay the course. Again, if you have time on your hands. Now, when you retire, you're gonna have three sources of income, your pension, your social security, and whatever you've saved up, uh, whether it be in deferred comp or savings accounts and so forth. Your pension, this is gonna be your biggest asset. Your pension is what's called a defined benefit plan. And a defined benefit plan means that you contributed along with your employer to this plan. You have no control over it. It's invested um, for you. And then when you retire, you're promised a monthly benefit for the rest of your life. How that's calculated based on what tier level you are. Now, I know there's different variations of tier levels, but I'm just going to go in broad, uh, you know, broad tier four and tier six level. A tier four is if you were hired prior to March 21st, 2012. Tier six, if you were hired after that date. The full retirement age for tier four is age 62. For tier six, it's age 63. Tier four, you contributed 3% of your salary for your first 10 years. That's your That was your contribution to the plan. But after the 10 years, you didn't contribute anything else. Tier six, you have to contribute three to 6% of your salary based on your salary level for your entire career. Um, how the, the pension is calculated is you take your number of years of service times your final average salary, times a factor. And that comes up with your pension. Your, your final average salary is your three highest consecutive years of salary. It doesn't have to be your three last. It usually is. Um, and, and tier six, it's five, your five highest consecutive years. So let's look at an example. Um, before we do that, when you, re, when you retire, you're going to have to make an extremely important decision. And that decision is how you want the pension paid out. The highest benefit you can get is what's called the single life option. And that means if you take this option, you'll get X amount of dollars for the rest of your life. But if you die, uh, no one gets the money. It, it goes back to the pension system. 
Okay, so the beneficiary doesn't get anything. That's the highest amount you can get. But let's say you can't do that because you have a loved one that's relying on this pension if you were to die. So you take a joint option. A joint option is a reduced amount payable for the, your life. But if you die, it continues to pay out to a beneficiary until they die. And it was what's called a pop-up. Pop-up is a joint option. But if your beneficiary dies before you, the pension pops up to the single life option. And I'm going to go over examples of these. And then there's what's called a, a term certain payout, which means it's guaranteed to pay out over a certain period of time, regardless of when you pass. So let's say you take a 10 year certain and you die in year five, it's going to pay out for five more years. If you die in tier, uh, year 11, it stops altogether. Here's an example of, of these um, of tier four. Let's say I'm a tier four employee. I'm age 62, and in this case, my beneficiary is my spouse, who's age 57. And let's say I have 30 years of service. And let's say my final average salary, my three highest years is 80,000 a year. So we take 30 years of service. In this case, the factor is 2%. I take 30 times two is 60%. 60% of 80,000 is my pension. So that's 48,000. If you could see that up here where I'm circling. So that's my single life option. However, if I take that and I die, my beneficiary doesn't get anything, okay? So if you have someone that's depending on this money, you may wanna choose a joint option. Let's say you choose the joint allowance 100%. Your pension gets reduced to $40,000 from 48. But if you die, your beneficiary will continue to get 40,000 for the rest of their life. So the pension system is paying out over two lives. So they pay out a lower amount. And the difference between the 40 and the 48 is based on the ages of you and the beneficiary. You can choose different uh, payout options. You can leave 50%, let's say. Let's say joint allowance 50%. You get 43,000 the rest of your life. If you die though, beneficiary gets half that, 21,000 for the rest of their life. So you have to kind of figure out what, you always have to look at the worst case scenario and say, well, if I die, or are my loved ones still protected? You know, or, or do they have a pension? Maybe, you know, I'll go over that in the next, next slide. Um, you know, you have to look at many factors and it's important because this decision is irrevocable. Once you make this decision, you have 30 days to rescind it. But after that, it's done. You can't five years later, choose a, you know, choose a joint allowance and say, I want to move to the single life or vice versa. You just can't do that because it's based upon ages at, at the time of the, um, uh, uh, of the election. Now, a pop-up is this pop-up allowance, 100%. It says I get 39,000 a year. Okay. If I die, my spouse gets 39,000 a year. But let's say my spouse dies first, mm -hmm. then mine pops up to the 48,000. So you can use this option. Let's say my spouse is older or not in good health. Um, I may want to choose this option, knowing that this, the beneficiary may predecease me and then allows me to pop up to the maximum amount. Okay, I'm just going to check and see if we have any questions so far. No, we're good. Okay, so like I mentioned earlier, if you have questions, please use the chat feature. And uh, if I don't get to them during the, um, the webinar, I will certainly um, answer them at the end. Okay, your next source of, um, of income in retirement is your Social Security. Now, Social Security is, you know, you've been paying into this all of your life and your employer also matches what you pay into it. Um, and it's kind of like a defined benefit plan, like your pension, you're promised a certain amount for the rest of your life. Uh, you can collect Social Security anywhere between age 62 and age 70, and it grows each year you delay it. If you look at age 67 here, where it says 100%, and down below it says FRA, this is what's called your full retirement age. This is where you're promised 100% of your Social Security benefit. Now, let's say I'm, I'm retired from uh, city service at age 62, and I want to collect Social Security. I can but it's gonna be a reduced amount. I'm only gonna collect 70% of the benefit because I'm collecting it early. I'm collecting it five years early. 
Now, each year I delay it, it grows a little bit until you reach your full retirement age of 100%. Now, there's one caveat with collecting early. You cannot collect early and still work. In, or you can't earn more than 20000 a year because then they start taking the Social Security back. You know, Social Security doesn't want people working full time and collecting at the same time. So there's, there's income limitations if you collect early. Now, once you reach full retirement age, you can collect Social Security and earn whatever you want. There's no more income limitation. So you can collect your full benefit and earn a million dollars a year. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, uh, as long as you reach that full retirement age, you can delay it all the way up to age 70 and then you collect 124% of your benefit. But once you reach 70, you have to start collecting. Uh, most, you know, going back to Social Security, most people ask, you know, when do I collect it? And my answer is, if you need it, take it. You know, you don't want to delay living. You know, it's, it's during these years where you're going to want to do the things that you've been putting off all these years because you're working. Um, you don't certainly want to delay it to get a higher number um, down the road. And maybe you, at that point, you know, you're not going to be spending the money or maybe spending on health care. So uh, if you need it, take it. Uh, if you have the ability to delay it and you you have you don't need it, then by all means delay it. But uh, but uh, don't put off living uh, for a higher benefit later on um, if you need it now. Now your other source of of uh, retirement is going to be what you put away in your deferred comp plan. Now deferred comp plan consists of um, a four hundred one k and a four fifty seven, and these are just IRS codes. Four hundred one k plans. Um, are available for like corporations. Um, uh, New York City has a 401k plan as well. 403Bs are for schools and, and charities and hospitals. And 457Bs are for government employees. So you have both eligible for to you is a 457 and a 401k plan. Now, these are what are called defined contribution plans, which means that you put the money in, it's your own money, and you direct how it's going to be invested. You select the investment choices that's available to you in the plan. The money will grow. Um, if you put it in pre-tax, it grows pre-tax. And then when you take it out in retirement, you pay tax on it at that point. You can also do a post-tax, whereas you don't get a tax benefit now. Uh, let me explain that a little further. So pre-tax, let's say I'm making 60000 a year and I put it in 5000 a year into my uh, 457. At the end of the year, I'm only going to be taxed on 55000 because that money comes out pre-tax. It'll grow. Um, and then when I take it out in retirement, that's when I get taxed on it because it's never been taxed before. But you can also choose what's called a post-tax version or a Roth version where, same example, I make sixty grand a year. I put in five. This year, I'm going to be taxed on sixty grand. I get taxed on the full amount. The money grows tax deferred just like the pre-tax. But when I take it out in retirement, the Roth version is tax-free. That means I don't pay tax on that money in retirement. So one, you get the tax benefit now, the other one, you get the tax benefit later. You can do both as long as you don't go over the contribution limits. In 2022, if you're under age 50, you can put in as much as 20,500 a year. If you're 50 and above, you can put in 27,000 a year. And you could do this if you're lucky enough. I don't know too many people that can do it, but you can contribute this amount to both plans that you have, the 401k and the 457. Now in 2023, because of high inflation, those limits are going up. Um, instead of 20,500, you could put in 22,500 if you're under age 50, but you can increase it up to 30,000 a year if you're over age 50. So preparing for retirement. Define what retirement is. Now, this is really important. You have to be ready for retirement, not just financially, but emotionally, psychologically. You want to, you have to figure out what you're going to do in retirement. Okay. I always tell folks, you, you tell me what you want to do in retirement and I'll let you know if you can afford to do that. Okay. You don't want to just wait for your, till age 62 when you reach full retirement age or, you know, reach a 30 years of service and say, well, okay, now I'm retired. What do I do? More importantly, can I afford to do what I want to do? Uh, so it's very, very important to plan ahead. Understand how your spending will change. Maybe certain expenses are going to go away. You may have new expenses, new hobbies, traveling, 
so forth that you may want to do. Um, identify where this money is going to come from. Uh, upon retirement, you know, you may have been aggressive with your asset allocation, your retirement plans all these years. Upon retirement, we may want to get a little more conservative. You know, get a pension projection, uh, get a social security projection. We want to know what your income is going to be in retirement. Meet with the city retirement council. They do telephone consultations now uh, so they can talk specifically what's available to you. And meet with us. You know, we we use this plan of like going to a doctor. Every year you should get a checkup just to see how you're doing. How are you getting towards retirement? Or is, is it feasible to retire at 62? You know, we can help you de uh, determine that. Last couple topics is estate planning. Estate planning sounds like, you know, something for the rich, you know, that uh, having an estate, but it's really just making sure that your wishes are heard in the event of a death or incapacitation. It governs how you're going to distribute your assets. You choose individuals that are going to manage the estate, like the, an executor and so forth. You designate guardians for your minors and it provides liquidity, let's say for final expenses. Everyone should get, um, basically four documents prepared. Uh, there's a will. A will will, well, let's take a step back. Your assets transfer in, in any number of ways upon death. Now, if you have a beneficiary on the account, let's say you have a beneficiary on your deferred comp, it's going to go to that person, regardless of what a will says or regardless of any verbal wishes that otherwise. It's a contract between you and deferred comp that says, if I die, it's going to this person. Okay. So, you know, you, you want to try to have beneficiaries on most everything, but you want to make sure the beneficiaries are up to date. You know, the person that you have as a beneficiary may not be in your life anymore. You know, I've seen many times where there's an ex-spouse beneficiary, and um, I'm sure the new spouse wouldn't be happy to hear that when, if you pass away. So um, you, you want to just make sure that beneficiaries are up to date. You can also transfer your assets through what's called TOD or POD accounts, which are transfer on death, payable on death accounts. So you can put a beneficiary just about anything except a checking account. You can do it with a savings account, mutual funds, savings bonds, you name it. Um, assets also transfer by way of joint property. Let's say I own my house with my wife. If I die, it's, the house is gonna go to her because it's held jointly. Now the will, will clean up everything that doesn't get transferred to a beneficiary. You know, let's say you have a bank account that doesn't have a beneficiary on it. It'll be distributed by way of the will. The will is a document that says, I leave this money to whoever. Um, the will has to be probated. Uh, it may take a long time for the beneficiaries to get their money. Uh, so you have to make sure that um, if someone needs money right away, that you you indicate them as a beneficiary as opposed to identifying them in a will. Another document that you should have is called a power of attorney. Power of attorney gives someone the financial, the, uh, the ability to make financial decisions on your behalf if you can't. So let's say I am in an accident, I go into a coma and my wife needs money from my deferred comp plan. Well, she can't get it because she's not on the account. It's, my, it's in my name. However, if I provide this power of attorney that says that if Jerry's in a coma, I can access his 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 money. Um, so uh, very important to have. Healthcare proxy is a document that uh, gives someone the medical this the power to make medical decisions on your behalf if you can't. And a living will is a document that outlines your wishes in a do not resuscitate situation. So all very important documents to have. Um, you know you kind of want this. You you know you you want your loved ones to have and an easy time of distribution. And it, so it's better if it's written out or your beneficiaries um, attached. So I've seen it time and time again where wishes are unclear and or there's nothing written down. And then there's fighting amongst family members uh, about you know who said this, who said that. So very important to, to have everything in place uh, before that, that day happens. So your checklist for estate planning is double check your beneficiaries, especially after life events like death or divorce and so forth. Make sure your assets are titled properly. Update your wills every every few years, other documents, uh, and just maintain a, an, a plan. Remember, you want everything to go smoothly for your loved ones if something should happen to you. Now, let's say you need financial assistance for anything. 
Um, you know, be thorough when you hire a financial advisor. The, the industry, I hate to say it, is not very well regulated. Anyone can call themselves a financial advisor. Te vas. No. So, okay, está bien. Um, so uh, what I re we recommend is that if you're looking for a financial advisor, make sure they have what's called a CFP or other credentials. CFP is a certified financial planner. Everyone here at Stacey Braun has a CFP. Understand how the planner earns compensation. Do they get paid by fees or commissions? Uh, both are okay. So everyone has to get paid somehow, but it may indicate on why they're pushing one product over another. Understand the scope of their services. You know, they, are they going to give just advice on one product or is it going to be advice on everything? And that's what we recommend is you look at the whole picture and get good advice on each aspect of that picture. And finally, ask the planner if they're a fiduciary, which means a fiduciary means you have to act in your best in, in your best interest, not in the interest of the planner. Okay, so um, uh, anyone who has a CFP designation is considered a fiduciary. Uh, we're we are considered fiduciaries here at Stacy Braun. So your roadblocks to financial success is not setting any goals. We just don't want to go through life, you know, not preparing not setting any goals, not having a vision of what retirement's gonna be like, not saving up properly for a house, not saving for education. Uh, we wanna get things on autopilot. Uh, poor preparation, lack of understanding of your insurance or your investments. Excessive debt is a big, big problem. Uh, so we need to keep that down. Uh, uninformed investment ch choices, uh, making rash decisions on your investments because market's going down or and whatnot. Inflation is a key key thing to keep in mind, especially with inflation so high right now. You know, let's say for example that that I need uh, five thousand dollars a month to live on in retirement, and let's say my Social Security and my pension equal five thousand dollars a month. I could say, great, I can I can retire, and the, and that may be true in the few, first few years, but with inflation, that five thousand dollars in ten years is going to be you're going to need six thousand a month. In twenty years, you're going to be need eight, six, uh, seven thousand dollars a month. And remember, you can theoretically live a third of your life in retirement. So we have to factor in that inflation is going to be there. Your pension does not grow with inflation. Your Social Security does. So we have to make sure there's other assets there to protect against that. Uh, we need to take taxation into consideration. Now, your your pension, your Social Security is not going to be taxed at the state or city level, it will be taxed at the federal level. So you, you have, you'll have very little state income tax. However, if you decide to move to another state, depending on the state, they may tax your pension. Um, so not every state is the same. So we'd have to look at, you know, where you're moving to is the overall cost of living lower to compensate for the taxation of your pension, or should you move to a state that doesn't have taxation? Like Florida, for example, is a popular state you know, Florida will tax, doesn't have any state income tax. So that's why it's a popular place to move to other than the weather. Uh, but let's say you want to move to South Carolina. South Carolina will tax your pension. Okay. But it's a very small amount. But the chances are that the lower cost of living in South Carolina far outweighs the tax you're going to have to pay on your pension. Um, the biggest roadblocks to your financial success is, is procrastination. Don't wait for a life event to happen, which most people do to seek advice, like don't wait for retirement, don't wait for um, a divorce or something. You wanna, you know, you wanna plan your finances as soon as possible. You wanna, like I said, we wanna set up a framework, know your net worth and build on it each year until you reach that certain goal. So your final tips, take a financial snapshot, know what your assets are, know what your debts are, use it to set goals. Know your monthly expenses. Make sure they're, don't live with beyond your means. Make sure your debt's under control. Invest your assets according to a plan. Get your social security projection. Get your pension projection. Meet with that pension counselor from the city if you're close to retirement. Protect your assets and your earnings through insur with insurance. Make sure all your affairs and orders. We want everything to be on autopilot. Um, and then meet with us. And again, you get six hours a year. Um, to, for all um, members, it is absolutely free to you. It's paid for by by the union, uh, and we don't sell anything. All we do is offer is suggestions and ideas. Nothing is sold. 
We do these consultations through telephone, through Zoom. Um, if we get people in the union office, we can do them there as well. Um, and we can discuss any financial matter you want. It could be retirement, getting out of debt, um, building back your credit score, buying a home. You name it, we'll talk about it with the exception of health insurance and property and casualty insurance. Um, we also have these uh, webinars. Um, we'll, we'll follow this one up probably with a, a retirement webinar. Uh, and then we have a website and email help desk as well. So I encourage you to reach out. Uh, here's our phone number and our website. The phone number is 888-949-1925. You'll be speaking with Jenny and she'll um, handle and schedule the consultation. And I promise you, you'll get something out of it. And and, and you don't have to fear yeah, that no. we're going to sell anything. Okay, strictly just advice. So I do hope to hear from you. I do have um, one question uh, so far. And if you have any questions, please send them in. Uh, the question, is there any way to avoid paying taxes on deferred comp? Unfortunately, uh, no. Now, one good thing about deferred comp, if you live in New York, aside from your pension and social security being state tax income free, uh, oh. income tax free, the first $20,000 you take out of deferred comp each year per person is not going to be taxed at the state level. It will be taxed at the federal level. Okay. Um, there's really no way to avoid paying taxes on that. The only thing you can do is if upon reaching age 72, when you have to start taking money out of your plans, um, if you donate it to charity, then you don't get taxed on it, but then you don't have it either. So um, that's not a not a choice for a lot of us. So, um, but yeah, no, it, it's grown without paying tax all these years. So the federal uh, government wants their taxes when you take it out, unfortunately. I have a question. Yes. First of all, Jerry, they got us as parole, we're probation. On United Parole, it says United Parole. Oh my God, I'm sorry. That's okay. We, we're not... It's it's common, but in the no, in, I know in, it's in, probation. I, I you know the I'll that's have okay. To, the person okay. who put it together, I'll have to. I'll, they're going to be fired tomorrow. Yes, all right. No, I, I don't <laughs> want to lose their job. Um, so, um, I have a couple of questions. Um, sure. On the on the retirement, right? First of all, let me just tell the members, those of you who joined us tonight, I really we really appreciate it. And Jerry and his team will be at the health and wellness event on December third at Anton's. Um, so it's not just about um, financial, it's about health and wellness, but when our money is right, then we can have less stress and our health can be at a better place too. So make sure you come and attend the event on December 3rd at Anton's. It starts at six o'clock, ends at 11 o'clock, and we'll have a couple of vendors there, including Jerry, Stacey Braun associates, associations, where you can have your own little consultations and set up some appointments. We have, Jerry, so we have attorneys that set up the wills yes. and the state planning. Yes. So right. So once they, once they, once the members set up their financial financial situations with you, right? Yes. Like with the um, it, whether stocks or what advice you give them, then we take that and we put that and we set put that, we set that up with our. Attorneys. You you can actually do them uh, together. Um, I mean, at the same time, you don't have to wait for one or the other. Okay. Okay, because the. The wills don't get specific as to the assets. Okay. They, they, so we'll be able to do it simultaneously. You can coordinate with the attorneys at Greenberg and Bresa Kelly. How does that work? Well, we we don't really, they don't, you don't need to have one done before the other. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, just let the members know, just a reminder for those who don't know, we do have attorneys that does the estate plan and all that other stuff. So you have your financial advisor and you also have the attorneys for the financial, for the um, estate planning and wills and stuff. Yeah. Um, is there with, with the stock market? What is not the stock market? That's another question. With the with the interest rates right now, if somebody wanted to purchase a home and interest rates are now kind of fluctuating, do you have a prediction on how the interest rate interest rates will be in another by the end of this year or the top of next year? Are these do you anticipate they're gonna go down? Well, interest rates right now are are the highest they've been uh, in a long time. They're, you know, mortgage rates are, are they're, they're, there's good. So what's happening For the mortgage, now, right, right. Yeah, what's happening right now is inflation's going up. And what, as a result of tame inflation, the Federal Reserve is increasing interest rates. And the, the benefit of that is that you get higher Social Security, you get higher rates on your CDs, higher rates on, mm. on 
uh, money market accounts or savings accounts. But the downside is, is that there's a higher cost of borrowing, such as mortgages. Now, mortgages are at 7% right now. Um, so it's it's a year ago from now, they were at 3%. So um, it, the prediction, it, it's hard to say. Now, the, the Fed today raised interest rates again, and they, they indicated that they're going to start, they're going to continue to raise, but at a slower pace. So that's a good sign. That's a good sign that inflation is is starting to get under control. Once it gets under control, then they start lowering the rates. Okay. When that happens, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that happens sometime next year, uh, 2023. Uh, there's going to be a period of where they stop raising and then it just stays okay. stagnant. And then, um, and then, then, then they'll come down again. Uh, no one really knows how it, you can't really predict that. Um, we are seeing the housing market starting to slow down a little bit because of the high mm -hmm. mortgage rates. So it's, it's, you know, housing, uh, the houses are staying on the market for a longer period of time as compared to even six months ago. Mm -hmm. So again, we're hoping for 2023 where it starts re reverting back. But um, I have to be honest, I don't think it's ever going to get to those levels of two to 3%, but hopefully it's lower than 7%. That's for sure. So life insurance, can you explain that? Is it good to have life insurance? We just, I just had a conversation myself with somebody about life insurance. And they told me they, that life insurance wasn't a good thing to have. I thought life insurance was good to have. I'm, it, if someone's me, depending I'm, on you, uh -huh. it's absolutely good. It's a must. Right. It's a must. But let's say no one's depending on me. Let's say I'm single and I don't have any children and no one's depending on me. Then I don't need life insurance. But if someone's depending on me, let's say spouse or child, um, uh, then yeah, I, they, I need it. It's, it's an absolute must to have. Okay. Um, when you when we talk about stocks, because I'm trying to stock things myself now. If you you start this stock market, you start you you work you will work with us to set up, I guess a profile of some sort. Yes. And but the because I'm but when it comes to stock, you still have to feed it, right? Let's say somebody gives you two thousand dollars, and we say, okay, we want to start with two thousand dollars, but it's also something that has to be fed like a savings account because it, that's, that's the best it, way to do it. Yes. Right. To, put, to put money in regularly because okay. as the market fluctuates, you don't want to just put money in when you feel it's good. You want to like, you're doing what your deferred comp you're putting money in every time you get paid. Okay. 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 It's called dollar cost averaging. So that's what you want to do. Um, instead of trying to time the market and figure out, well, is it good to invest now? No, I'll wait. Now you have to consider stocks are down 20% this year. It's the equivalent of a sale. You know, so think of that. Every time you put money in deferred comp, you're buying these stocks at a low price. Right. So what's the best, what's the, for, for people to, you said something about it's best to move your money around and not put it all in one space, in one place. In sure. other words, so you do a little stock, you do some, if you can do some real estate, you do some, is real estate a good investment to have? You, you need to have savings for an emergency fund. Now right. you're not going to earn a lot, but it's, it's important. Like, let's say, for example, I don't have anything in my savings account and my, uh, my heater goes and I, I'm going to have to pay $5,000. Well, right now with the high interest rates, if I don't have an emergency fund, it's going on a credit card. Right. Now I'm going to yeah. be paying the 25% interest on this heater. Um, Whereas if I had the five thousand dollars set aside, I can avoid that and use that to to meet the emergency. So you do want some savings. You need a cushion, uh, you know, in the event that something does come up. So the earlier you start your deferred comp account, the better. Earlier, you, the better. Right, it's, but if you're old head like like myself, no. <laughs> um, that might have like five minutes. Let me stop. It, it's no matter when you start, it's a good time to start. It's never too late, too late. even if and, you. Huh? Three months away from retirement, I would say start it. And then, the, um, so would you recommend for every time, like you said, every time you get a raise, you take a percentage of that raise, of that raise, and put because out of sight, out of mind, you never had it before. That, that would be a great idea. And let's say you're putting in three percent of your salary right now, and you get a, a one percent raise. If you could keep your same standard of living and now increase your contributions to four percent, that's great, and you keep doing that um, instead of spending it. You know, because right. we all know once money comes into our hands, it's it's gone. So mm -hmm. it's good to get it out of our hands before it even gets there. Another question. Is it good to 
sometimes um, some people, they, they, for their reasons, leave, they retire before retirement age. Yes. So they take a finance, they take a hit. Yep. Without, without pensions, like 21, yes. depends on when they, um, what do you say about that? What is your input? Well, I mean, sometimes some people have their personal reasons why. Yeah. I mean, if you have to retire for personal reasons, uh, you know, um, you have to, I mean, uh, you have to take a lot into consideration, you know, maybe, or maybe you have a, a, a spouse that's at full retirement age and they have a pension. Right, so you have to look at all the aspects. Um, you know, there, it's a big penalty. It's about, you know, um, 20, 27, 20, yeah, like 27% going at 55, as opposed to 62. That's a big chunk. And that's for the rest of your life. So and what about, um, and, if, and if you're not retirement age, I mean, pension, what is it? Um, Social Security age, then you have to live just with that. Yeah, dollar. yeah. If you retire at fifty-five, take a penalty. You can't collect Social Security until sixty-two. So there's seven years there where you're just living on the, a, a, a lower pension. You know, so you have to take a lot into consideration. You know, your benefits as well, um, your health insurance. The you know what what you have to pay. Um, Obviously, working longer is financially better, but you also want to balance your 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 life with work. Right. Okay. And, all right. I so, have and, a question. I'm sorry. I have a question too. Oh. Hi, this is Pat. I had a question. Um, so I do have a college savings for both um my children. However, um, I do have some because I continue to put into the savings. So I wanted to know, um, can that savings be transferred to someone else? Like for example, I do have my guy, cause I don't have too many young people who are approaching college stages, um, but I do have my godson who is approaching, approaching that college stage. So sure. is it possible to um, I guess, transfer it to him since he is going to be approaching that college stage. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the 529 plan is, is an asset in your name and the student is what they call the beneficiary. You, okay. can, change, you can change that beneficiary at any time. It okay. doesn't have to be a relative. It could be anybody. So let's okay. say you want to change it to your, your godson. You mm -hmm. just change the beneficiary to, to him Mm -hmm. And then as long as they use it for education, then it's tax-free when you take it out. And but yes, you can it, change the beneficiary anytime. So would I still be managing that account? It's um, always your money. Yes. Okay, got yep. it. Yep, because I kind of do want to still manage and make sure that he's getting it for school. Yep. No, you control it. And it's, okay. never, it's never his unless you, you decide it is. Okay, and, wonderful. Thank you so much. No and problem. Jerry, if we want to take that same five two nine money, for and, and like 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 Ms. Jolson is doing, and we want to use it for ourselves because our kids are finished and now we retire and then we want to go go back to school. Can yeah, you can it? absolutely use it. Oh, great. Oh, yeah, cool. as long as it's used for education, anyone can use it. Oh, cool. Anybody yeah. else got a question? Somebody so, said this is this is Travius. What's up, Trey? So. Um, my question is, with, you mentioned that stocks are, is like a sale right now. Would it be um, beneficial to move some of our deferred comp and put it in high risk? Would we, you know, earn, I guess, would it grow when, when things uh, turn around? Would we see a substantial growth? Well, it, it depends. Um, you know, it depends on when you're going to need this money. You know, a lot of folks think that, you know, when they retire, you have to move everything to stable value, which you don't. Because like I said before, you can live 20, 30 years of retirement. So you still want to have it growing. But when do you need the money? If you don't need the money for 10 plus years, you could take risk. Because there's never really been a 10-year period where you're going to lose money in stocks. Now, you, if you moved everything from stable value to stocks right now, it could be a good move. Um, the market can still drop further. We don't know. You know, anything can happen. But no, no one can predict the market, what's going to happen today or tomorrow or next month. What I could do predict is that over the course of 10, 15, 20 years, you will make money. Um, I have one more 
Oh, one more so question. it's on a, on a personal basis. Okay. So you also have to be able to withstand the risk. Too. Yeah, breaking the okay. news. So um, my next question is, this is a pension question. When they calculate, when NICES calculate our pension, are they including all of our earnings? Like we get these extra um, payments. Yeah. Like is it like from... What is it? Gain share, longevity, those payments. Are those payments um, pensionable? Huh? No. Um, so which which were the longevity? Longevity, the long the increments, the increments like we have a we have increments called like step money. Yeah. Step yeah. money is pensionable. The, the, the that I'm not sure. Ones. That, That's something that sure. it's on your it, no, if this answer a question. It's on your ESS. They'll tell you whether it's pinchable or not. You can see it. It says on the, pin, on the ESS. It oh, is it though. does. Yeah, it does say pensionable. It'll say it. Right next to each row, they'll have your what you made for the two weeks and it has increments, has increment increased longevity, and they'll tell you whether it's pensionable. Which they are. Okay. Okay. And, plus, and what about and then, the then when, I think you gotta go to the nicest and they could tell you what, what's being calculated. I mean, so, is the, what about the what about the gain share? Is is that pensionable too? It just I'm seems sure. like what I earn when I look at my total of what I earn, and then I do the calculations, the predictor exactly. from NICES, It's always lower than what I've earned. So I was just wondering, are they including those? Um, he wouldn't know that. Yeah, I don't. I don't okay. know that. I know no, certain no, things no. are not pensionable, but I don't know the specifics okay. on that. He, that's okay. not. That's not a question. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody's got a question? Um, the death. It was something I had a question. Um, what is stable stable value? Can I stable value is an option in your um, deferred comp plan that it's the safest investment. It's like having money in a bank account. Okay. Okay. So you're not going to lose money, but you're not earning a lot either. You know, okay. right now, I think the stable value rate of return, I think is around two to two and a half percent a year. Um, so you're not earning a lot of money on it, but it is safe. Uh, but if you're a long-term investor, um, unless you're extremely conservative, I, I don't recommend stable value if you have a lot of years to go before retirement, mm -hmm. you know, because... The, the power of compounding interest works best the, over the long term in stocks as opposed to stable value. To, 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 to piggyback off with Officer SPO Cunningham just asked you, the younger you are, the more likely you could take risks. The older you are, the more safe you should Absolutely. invest. Okay, so that kind of, yep. and that's like you said, it's a, yeah, it's if a I, personal. If I meet someone under, under 40, and I say, you know what, if you're not going to, you're retiring at 62, put all your deferred comp in stocks because you have 22 years to invest. And, and if the market drops tomorrow, who cares? It'll, it, history shows it'll recover. And what's your opinion about these Robin Hood accounts that they have on these apps with the Rob? Is, is it, is it safe to, in, to get involved with these? Robin Hood, you know these. Yeah, I mean it's just a, a, it's just an uh, an online or mobile phone way of investing. Um, I you know it, it's safe, but you select the investments that you want to choose. So a lot of folks use it to to buy risky investments and all that. But um, you, you know you could buy whatever you want through Robin Hood. It, it it depends on the risk you want to take, uh, but right. the the platform itself is fine. So going back to investment advisors, so you. Stacey Braun, once again, any more questions before we wrap it up? Um, mute your phone. Okay, I'm getting ready. To, I think that's it. Let's get some more questions. So we're going to wrap it up. Those of you who joined us at the end, this will be on our UPOA YouTube, and it'll be on our website for you to refer back to, um, to for you to see it from the beginning. So once again, um. Jerry will be at the health and wellness event on December 3rd at Anton's um, where you can ask him more questions and set up appointments or you can call the number here at 888-949-1925. And I highly recommend that, you know, you all take advantage of this financial um, advisor benefit. Once again, it's no cost to you with financial planning benefit. It's no cost to you. It, I think it's a good benefit to have. And I hope that you all 
like I said, take advantage of it. Um, Jerry, we thank you. All right. Thank you. Everybody Thanks, get home safe. Yep. And have a good and night. I, and I see you all on December well, 3rd. Wait, I have wait. I have one more question, but I, I still have that Okay, I'll be back. I have one more question. This is question is this question is specific to me. So I have six more years before I retire. What would you say I should do with the money I have in my deferred cop? You should make an appointment with him exactly. and he's going to tell you. Oh, That's what this is all you know, about. <laughs> making, okay. making, you know, general recommendations, um, you know, it, it's hard to do because I don't know your full story. I would need to know okay. when are you going to need this money? You know, when you retire, are you gonna, is your pension and Social Security going to be enough to live on? Do you have time to let this grow a little bit more? It all depends on how much time you have. And that's based on each individual person, uh, not a group. How many times, so, wait, how many times do you once again, how many times can we see you in a year? Six hours a year. So, so um, we can see okay. Jerry as many times as you want. This is all for your at your own between okay, your I'll will go. planning and state planning. You guys have a wealth of of um as accessibility Resources. and stuff that we never had before. You have yeah, financial you have advisors, benefits. right? You got lawyers now that can help you with your wills and help you plan personally. And Jerry, either you can you can come here and meet him at the office or however you you know on Zoom instead of your own personal. Um, somebody else says okay. I'm eligible to retire and I've done deferred comp. I don't know how much longer I will be working. Should I def should I do deferred comp? He, he, he yeah. Told. Yes. Yeah. If you can afford, if it's even if you have budget, three months, if it fits into <laughs> your budget, definitely do deferred comp, no matter how much time you have left. Yeah, because Jerry, every, every one more question. That's oh, chief back. Can, it, can I? I know I've got one more question. No, you guys, it's okay. Can if I retire? Because my my plans is not to use my deferred comp even right. when I retire. That's can good. I leave it there and continue to invest it? Yeah. You, so you can you, you can you leave it there as long as you want, but you can't add okay. to it. Oh, you can't add to it. Once can't you, add to it. It'll stay invested and it'll grow, but you can't add to it. Jerry, we have annuity oh. now. Wait a minute, we have annuity plans that we, I just, for my, well, that's my right. first yeah. contract, I forgot, remember? So we yeah, now yeah. have annuity money. So how would that work? Because some of us, like an uh, old head like me, we won't benefit, I'll, I'll get, we'll get something, but the younger officers will get, if they stay, will benefit. I forgot if, can you invest the annuity on your own or does it have to, is it invested for you? It's invested, you guys are doing it for us. Oh, that's <laughs> That's the other side of the business. Right. You guys yeah, so, are investing our new even Yeah, so we invest it as a group. We don't invest it on an individual basis. So um it is it'll be what it'll be when you when you retire and when it's available to you. But if when I retire, when Travis retires, can she now say to you, Jerry, I got this money. Can you tell us what to how to best yeah. invest yeah, in it? Yeah, you would take the money or, out or of it. We the can leave it there as well, too, and you can continue an investment. Yeah, plan, you could right? take it out, you, you spend it, you could put it into an IRA, you can roll it into your deferred comp, you could do whatever you want with it. Or we could just leave it with y'all, and y'all could just keep investing it. Yeah. You don't have to tell. That's another thing, y'all, about the annuity that we now have. You could just like let it just sit there, and Stacey Braun, who's also invested the welfare funds money, then also investing your money, is helping your money grow. You could just leave it there or get with Jerry. And figure out what you want to do when it's time for you to go or just let it sit. Like, you know, you don't have to touch it at all. But that's good. So like I said, yo, the reason I did this is because um, I want us to, um, I'm not saying that we're not money smart, but I just want this, us to be able to be in a better place than we were when we walked in the door. Some of us probably are, some of us are probably not. But the more e education that we get on how to manage money, respect the dollar, and help the, the dollar grow for our benefit and for our family benefit, I thought it was a good, the trustees, not me, just me, the trustees and myself thought it was a good um, package to have, to, to have that accessibility. So like I said, if you guys didn't catch it all in the beginning, just go to our YouTube. I say by the end of the week, it should be over the top of next week. It should yeah. be up. Jerry will send it over to. Um, and we'll have the presentation available too with the correction on it. Yeah, with the correction, make sure it says probation. Um, <laughs> with the right, the right, um, you'll have access to it. You can watch it over and over again. And we suggest that you sit with your children and start and letting them watch the, the YouTube presentation because we want to start putting it in there if you haven't already. But if you have, that's good. If you haven't, have them sit with you to also. Can you also invest the children's of the active? 
Yeah. The, so work? the six hours that you get each year, you can use it however you want. Mm -hmm. As long as long as you're there in the consultation, we can have you can have your parents there, your children there. Um, however you want to use the six hours. So I definitely recommend if you, if you used up your time um, and you still have time left over and you want, let's say you want me to talk to one of your children, um, that's if you want to use the benefit that way, that's fine. You, and can we set up um, a, a profiles for our kids? Or is it just for the, can we set up profiles for our kids? Or can yeah. We, yeah. So the kids can set up, a, a pro, okay, that's good. That's good yeah. to know. As young as, no matter how old they are, we can start setting up. Well, you know, I mean, we would, a profile meaning we would make recommendations on where to okay. invest the money, but a uh, anyone under 18 cannot open a, an investment okay. account. They, up until that point, the parent or custodian has to do that. And then it transfers to the child at age 21. Okay. Um, but that's something we could talk about. That's what we could talk about. Okay. So I guess that, wait a minute, how much money do each of us get for the annuity? Okay, let me just answer this question. So the the um annuity is now two sixty one for each year for each person, and if you set up your ASO account, you can go on to the ASO account and see how much money you have in your annuity annuity right now. So you can watch your money grow as Stacy Braun um invests investing in. So you can look at it now. I don't know how much you have, but if each person gets two sixty one two hundred sixty one dollars for the year. To start and for the next contract we're going to have that dollar amount i'm gonna try to get that dollar amount doubled so that we can start you know but this is our first time having it but that's what this that's what it's starting off at right now good okay so i'm gonna let everybody go it's getting late and y'all get home safe if you're not home already and i'll talk to you guys later and i'll see you on december 3rd okay right, have a good night good night bye-bye